Okay, with me today is Professor Guy McPherson. And I think Guy McPherson needs no introduction to my audience. I think everybody knows who he is, but in case somebody doesn't know who he is, let me do a formal introduction. Uh, Guy McPherson is Professor Emeritus of Natural Resources, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona. He's the world expert on abrupt climate change and near-term human extinction, a term which he coined. Okay, um, what this interview is really about is not normally, I think, your normal interview topic. It's a little bit off beam, and that's um, because it's an action to take that's really um, a mass default on debt as a protest against really climate inaction and also as a kind of monkey wrenching of the economy. Okay, so the, the idea is a mass uh, debt strike for climate is what we're calling it. And the idea is that the financial markets are particularly vulnerable to debt and a debt strike. So if you have a look at what's happened in the past in terms of uh, CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, there's really nothing that's been effective in terms of individual action, in terms of policy, in terms of Kyoto and Paris, and uh, in terms of carbon taxes and everything you can care to think of, none of them have worked. In fact, some, most of them have been really negative, or at least the emissions have gone up while these policies have been in place. And as far as I can see, there's only one thing that really had a dent on CO2 emissions, and that's the slowdown in 2008. So the Great Recession uh, had a significant impact, and I think it's about 12%. I was having a look. Um, I think the reduction by 2010 was 12%, and that matches the slowdown in economic activity. So, you know, I presume they closely related and correlated. So, you know, you say anything that will slow down the economy would slow down and basically, you know, pull emergency handbrake on CO2 emissions. Now, as soon as you say that, then people start saying, well, hang on a minute, what about the McPherson paradox? At least people that hang around these kind of channels. So my first question to you is, can you just briefly explain the McPherson paradox and why it would be a danger if you had a rapid a deacceleration of CO2 emissions, or, or rather industrial activity rather than CO2, because this is, we're talking about aerosols, right? So uh, do you think that the economy is so um, closely correlated with, say, um, coal-fired power stations that if you had a reduction in, say, the consumption of electricity, you'd automatically have a, um, a reduction in global dimming, and that would be, have really negative consequences? Uh, so if you could just explain the McPherson paradox and then just explain if this would be a really bad thing to do because of the McPherson paradox. Right. And so I'll explain the paradox and how I arrived at, at having it called that. I did not name it. Uh, my friend Bill Eddy named it the McPherson paradox. I don't have quite that much hubris. In any event, I, I recognized that the industrial economy, which is, as you hinted, is largely driven by coal, was very strongly correlated with emissions, with greenhouse gas emissions. And so for me, that just screamed jumping out of the economic system. So I did. So that's why I began looking for a place to move off grid in 2004 and ultimately committed in 2007 and lived off grid, defecating in a bucket for 10 years, making those sacrifices that so few people were willing to make as it turned out. In trying to set an example, which had always been my approach as a teacher. And then in late 2011, James Hansen and colleagues published a paper on the aerosol masking effect, but it indicated 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 degrees Celsius by terminating the entire industrial economy. And that's, I couldn't imagine that we would terminate the entire, entire industri industrial economy. So that seems so far out there that we would never stop burning the last bit of coal. So I didn't think that the aerosol masking effect was going to be sufficient to justify 
um, ratcheting up coal-fired power plants, for example, or, or maintaining industrial activity in general. But then along comes a paper by Levy and colleagues in 2013, indicating as little as 35% reduction in industrial activity will drive a one degree Celsius global average temperature rise. And the time frames we're talking about here are very, very short. Hansen said in an interview five days between when we slow or stop industrial activity and all those aerosols fall out of the sky and lead to abrupt warming. The general consensus among other climate scientists subsequently has been about six weeks, but either way, five days to six weeks, it's a very, very short period of time, way too fast for organisms to keep up. And then along comes a paper by Rosenfeld and colleagues in February of this year, of 2019, specifically citing the Levy et al. paper and pointing out that it was too conservative. So as little as 35% drives a one degree global average temperature rise, in a very short period of time, the subsequent research indicates that that's too conservative and doesn't indicate, they didn't reach a conclusion at what point we would drive any sort of increase in global average temperature. Would it be 25% reduction in industrial activity? Would it be a 10%? Reduction? We don't really know. So that puts us into this very difficult situation. We don't know at what point our actions that are contrary to the industrial economy or in fact are intended to monkey wrench the industrial economy. We don't know at what point they become adequate or maybe beyond adequate and cause increased heating as a result of the loss of the aerosol masking effect or the reduction of the aerosol masking effect. So that puts us in this awkward position. I'm a huge fan of monkey wrenching. I started reading mm -hmm. Edward Abbey's work when I was in my early 20s in college, and, and his anarchistic approach was very appealing to me. Subsequently become a good friend of perhaps the best known monkey wrencher in the world, Doug Peacock, who, who formed the basis for the character George Washington Hey Duke in the Monkey Wrench Gang, the 1975 book, and also the sequel, Hey Duke Lives. So, you know, on the one hand, I'm a big fan of stopping the omnicide that is underlain by industrial activity. On the other hand, I now recognize that by reducing industrial activity by as, we don't even know how much, that will trigger an abrupt rise in temperature that not only will almost certainly cause loss of habitat for humans, but also loss of habitat for thousands of other species on the planet. So we're really in this catch-22, and we don't know enough to determine whether we should turn down the engine 12%, 14%, 32%. We just don't know at what point we cause an increased number of extinctions relative to the ongoing industrial activity, which is just horrible enough. Yeah. So could you please clear up a technical detail for me? I'm not a climatologist. I've studied a bit of meteorology just because as a pilot and sailor and that kind of thing. But the, um, the thing that I'm struggling to understand is the, the aerosols in the air, uh, they cause massive global dimming and the effect is very strong in terms of percentage of solar radiation that's reduced. But since it's not reflecting the solar radiation, it's not an albedo effect, then surely the the sulfates and aerosols must be absorbing. I mean, they're, they're black material, right? So they should be absorbing the energy anyway. So the, there's heat. I mean, maybe the solar radiation doesn't get to the ground, but there must be heat in the upper atmosphere wherever the bulk of the pollution is. Isn't that correct? So there yeah, is still a heating effect. It's not just a negative cooling effect. Is that right? That's right. I believe that's correct. And, but it's the individual particles absorbing that heat. And, and they all fall out of the atmosphere and land on, the, on planet Earth anyway, on the ground or in the water. So, what, again, this is one of those unknowns, at least for me. What kind of impact does that have by absorbing the heat and then falling to the ground? I don't know the answer to that question. Is, is anybody doing much research on this? Uh, is there, you, you would think this is a, a question that's got to be as important as the, you know, the methane emissions, and people are taking that seriously now. But uh, right. you, know, you know, I think this is the most important 
contributor to planetary warming, or potentially the greatest contributor to planetary warming, is the aerosol masking effect. And there's been relatively little research conducted on the matter. Uh, it, there was an, a BBC one hour documentary done on it in 2005, as near as I can tell, YouTube is working like mad to make sure it never gets reposted on <laughs> online again. And so it keeps popping up for 10 minutes and they, they remove it. And so that was 2005. And at that point, I would say the artists were ahead of the scientists because we didn't really know a lot. We knew about the contrail effect from 9-11 mm -hmm. in 2001, but we didn't know about the aerosol masking effect. And those are two separate things with different rates of change. So we didn't know a lot about the scientific basis for the aerosol mask effect when that one hour documentary came out from the BBC. Now we know a considerable amount and nobody's talking about it. And I think that's by design because the media and the governments are so greatly influenced, you might even say controlled by a relatively small number of people who don't want certain information to be spread around. Yeah, I have. And, been, oh, sorry. So I suspect that we are being lied to, at least by omission, because we know a lot now about the aerosol masking effect in this latest paper by Rosenberg and colleagues in Science, of all places. That should be front page news. It's in mm -hmm. Science. This is a big deal, and they specifically cite the Levy and, and colleagues' paper from 2013 as pointing out it's too conservative. Why isn't this on the news everywhere? I don't know. It seems to me that it should be on the news everywhere. This is certainly as important as the United States military misadventures around the planet. We hear about those all the time. This is certainly as important as anything the Kardashians have going on. We hear about them all the time. So I, it's just one of those things that uh, I can't explain, and I wish I could. Yeah, I have been asked by people who are saying is, um, you know, why isn't the coal industry saying, you know, hey, you can't do without coal, coal's essential because <laughs> the aerosol masking effect and we're doing our green bit to <laughs> keep the planet cool. But um, my, my assumption is just a wild guess that, uh, you know, that's political dynamite. They, they don't want people to think about climate change and they don't want to think, uh, you know, it's really politically sensitive to say that we're in such a precarious position that we're relying on, you know, the coal industry to, uh, to stop a one degree <laughs> rising. Right. So right. that's uh, too much of a hot potato is my assumption. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's right. And it, it also allows the continuation of the narrative that, that you, you and me, and people who don't have a lot of control over anything need to reduce our emissions. Why is that? So the, the people who actually pull the strings, strings of empire, the people who like to jet around the planet all the time, so they can not have to worry about reducing their emissions. So, yeah. so it's sort of shifting the blame and pointing the finger at the wrong people and maybe hoping, wishing that that all balances out, that if you and I reduce our emissions, that'll allow the, the one percenters to keep earning like there's no tomorrow with no adverse consequences. I don't know. You know, there's a lot about the world I don't understand. So, well, one of the things that, uh, you know, talking about things that are outside the Overton window and third rails that are too hard to touch and, you know, the, the I think the thing that another one of these elephants in the room is is China. So it's really all about China. I mean, I've said in my videos, nobody will, you know, face this point that, you know, the best way to see the climate catastrophe that we're in is that America uh, was, you know, basically putting too much burden on this planet. And that's 320 million people. Now, China, which the average Chinese has half the carbon footprint of American, but they're trying to achieve the same standard of living, which implies that they will have the carbon footprint of an American. In other words, each Chinese will double their carbon footprint. But, you know, they're, they're four times as many Chinese as there are Americans, and that's the problem. That's why CO2 is going up. Uh, it's all about slowing down China. They're building a new coal-fired power station every week. Right. So, 
uh, and but nobody will address this rather politically incorrect, you know, ethno-nationalist <laughs> kind of argument. It sounds a bit um, right wing and stuff. So, um, you, do you care to comment on on that and why nobody will, or what what do you think uh, China's impact in is? Is my assessment correct? Because this is all about China, and if you're going to do something about it and mitigate it, it, it must imply mitigating China's growth which is a tremendous thing politically. But right, but, you know, back in the days of the Cold War, when you and I were children, when we were coming of age, there was this concern that we would enter into a war, a hot war with the Soviet Union. And, and that kept everybody in their seats or sometimes under their desks, depending upon the day. And had us all really captivated by fear and captive by that fear. And we were in mutually assured destruction zone. And I think we're in the same situation with China, but this time it's economic. So we, the, the corporations and the government of the United States are not gonna point the finger at China and say, you need to slow them because China owns the United States or at least a significant chunk of it. Mm -hmm. So that would be like us blaming the boss. You know, we work for this person and we can't yell at him and point fingers at him in front of the customers because that's going to ensure that bad things are going to happen with our ability to maintain our income. And I, I see it as the same sort of situation with China. But, but it's everything. You know, it's not vegans and it's not carnivores and it's not... Mormons and it's not Baptists and it's not them and it's not us. I was pointing out 20 years ago in my classrooms that the environmental footprint of an American, somebody who lived in the United States, was 25 to 50 times greater than the environmental footprint of somebody who lives in Africa. And I would have people fill out this environmental footprint online quiz and have them have us work through via discussion why their footprint was so much lower if all they did was change their place where they're living, change to Nigeria, for example, don't change anything else. And suddenly your environmental footprint is 90%. How could that be? And it's because of the military, it's because of the culture, it's a society, it's having the air conditioner running on every grocery store as soon as you walk in. It's all these things. And what good does it do for, so, and this is what I used to do all the time. I tell my students that their environmental footprint was far greater than even if they ch chose to live the exact same way in Nigeria or Ghana or wherever, pick a, an African country. And after I gave one of these talks, one of my students came up and introduced her, her daughter and said, Guy, I'd like you to meet my 37 children, Sarah. You know, so she got it right away. And then she had another child. So she had two children, just like all my, all my students did. You know, nobody's, it's really difficult to overcome our evolutionary instinct, to overcome that drive. So yes, it's China, and yes, it's the United States, and yes, it's the developing parts of the world that are trying to catch up with what we've, the, the enormous privilege that we've enjoyed in the United States and Western Europe and Australia and Japan for a, a generation or two. So of course people want what we have, but everybody wanting what we have, the privilege that we've enjoyed for essentially our entire lives, you and I and people who look a lot like us, that's the problem. Everybody wants this, of course, why would they not? I want to go to school cheap. I want to get a good education so they can get a high paying job where I don't have to work very hard. Who wouldn't want that? And if that means that we have to trash the planet, well, it's you, it's, it's him, it's somebody else who's trashing the planet. It's not really me, at least not to a very large extent. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And that's how we got here. Yeah. So I, I think you think that there probably isn't much chance that we pull through, we'd probably do for near-term human extinction. And I have to agree with you on that. I mean, I, I think 
for a long time it's been a psychological issue as you say and we just are not going to turn the psychology around fast enough and i probably the tipping points the climate tipping points um are already in the rearview mirror so it's probably too late already but even if it wasn't uh you know people are not going to reverse their psychology in the next decade or two and as you've mentioned you know the temperature lags uh, co2 emissions by about 10 years so our goose is really cooked but the question now is um i know that you often say well you should uh, just act as if uh, there was something we could do about it and i'm kind of thinking of this kind of death strike as a kind of death with dignity kind of thing is you know we at least uh well, there are a number of upsides that I can see, but I'd like to hear what you think. But one of them is, um, if uh, if the collapse is not a, that abrupt, in other words, it takes maybe a couple of decades, who could tell really, uh, then we, we should try to get more robust and resilient. This whole idea that you, you just announce something like, oh, we're going to damage the economy. And oh, no, you're going to touch the sacred cow that's you know <laughs> crime of, of tremendous <laughs> um yeah uh, basically it's tremendous thought crime to actually think of you know damaging our sacred cow the economy and people talk as if you know the, the only thing between us and starvation is a bunch of bankers on wall street right and i'm thinking that you know people should be forced into um homesteading and victory gardens and being more resilient basically to get out of uh, mass production and mass consumption food because i can't really see in the coming climate scenarios that um you know we'll be able to transport cucumbers from new zealand just for you know new yorkers and stuff and so yeah, people will have to get away from the five food companies and get onto a system that is more resilient. So shouldn't we be forcing people to at least at least just raising this as debt strike as a as a proposal to get the conversation going, at least gets people starting to think down these these avenues. It might ease the pain when a human extinction really starts to to hit the news. Right. But what do you think? Right. You know, I was stunned. I was stunned when I walked away from my privileged position and gave up on the monetary system. I was stunned when nobody followed. <laughs> and now I just laugh at that because the hubris to think that one 49 year old white man would have that kind of impact on 320 or 340 billion people in the United States, much less beyond them, is simply ludicrous, obviously. But clearly I wasn't thinking clearly at the time. Uh, so, but, but what I demonstrated with that exercise is that one privileged individual with essentially no skills at all can learn to grow food for several people, can learn to take responsibility for his own life and the lives of the people around him, which is the sort of thing that I'd been teaching by pursuing classroom anarchism for many years, but then actually the rubber hitting the road where it's me making the decisions about which species to plant and where to spend my time today milking the goat or watering this almond tree and so on. So I think that would have been a great idea. Maybe it still is a great idea. Forcing people, I'm not so sure about that. We've had a total a, a, a government verging on totalitarianism for a long time. I'd, I wouldn't like us to get into the situation where we actually have death camps for people who don't follow the orders of the Fuhrer, I mean of the president. <clears throat> but so I'm not sure how far down this road to go. I, I think that we should be telling the full truth and pointing out to people that they can probably extend their run on earth, maybe only for a few days, maybe for a few weeks, maybe for a few months, maybe even for a few years, if they start learning how to grow their own food and take responsibility for their water supply as well. You know, when, and, and there are a few examples that come to mind. When people are in their last days and they have money, they will spend millions of dollars per day just to extend their lives. Mm. So when maybe if we tell people that the difference here is only a matter of a few weeks or a few months, 
maybe people will pour themselves into the project regardless, which I don't think would be a bad thing. How this plays out, we don't know. It's, it's a classic situation that we don't know. We cannot predict the future with great accuracy, especially with respect to the individual or the family. You know, I don't, you might get hit by an asteroid today that would only impact me the day after tomorrow. <laughs> mm. but, so we don't know the outcome of our actions. So I think, and I've been preaching this message for so long, it's probably boring to you. I think that we need to take action and importantly, not be attached to the outcome. In fact, a line from Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning that I've been quoting a lot lately comes to mind. The last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances. So we're pretty privileged right now. We see a lot of people around us who are not so privileged, who are experiencing great pain, who are migrating, who are moving from one part of the world to another because they can no longer survive in a location where their family has lived for the last fill in the blank generations, many generations. So people are already experiencing great pain. How we act in the face of that, that's up to us. We, the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in these set of circumstances. How do we act? How do we feel? How do we respond to these circumstances? Do we provide breadcrumbs for the people who have little, as Frankel was discussing in his book? Do we give our last bit of food to somebody else? Or do we not? You know, I sometimes joke that one of the reasons I've gained about 30 pounds in the last few months is so I could prepare for this hard time. <laughs> and, as I say, it's been pointed out on YouTube a few thousand times that I've gained weight. Thanks. I knew that, people. You don't need to make that comment. <laughs> That's from your tour, I presume. <laughs> They've been whining and dining you too well. Actually, it happened when I was in Belize, of all places, where everybody around me was losing weight. And I was spending so much of my time online with such a slow connection that it took 10 minutes to do 10 seconds worth of work. And I had to feed myself that whole time, obviously. <laughs> so that's where it came from, tragically. Anyway, so I think we should be taking what a Buddhist would call right action. I think we should not be attached to the outcome. I think that among those actions we should take is taking responsibility for ourselves, including growing food and using securing our water supply and and ensuring that we have a decent human community around us and and so on does that does that mean we should rely upon the government that we should push the governments of the world to take these actions on our behalf i don't know that gets into a pretty sketchy area for me mm -hmm. and, and and i'm not a political commentator especially mm -hmm. since i've been a essentially an anarchist my entire life. So I'm kind of hesitant to talk about what the government ought to do. Well, yeah, I'm kind of with you on the anarchy. But um, so, yeah, just, but I think we need to go a little bit into the politics of it, because if you're talking about a debt strike, I mean, it's, it's really, you can't escape the politics of it. So I think the election results are coming in for the EU today. And it's turned out that, the big gainers are the Green Party on, you know, basically environmental, but there's big movement in terms of climate. I think they've got an extra 17 seats or something like that. Um, so climate became a big issue. Uh, and so th that's on the left. And on the right, there's been a movement, strong movement towards the populist uh, thing. So it, it looks like that's the way the world is headed in terms of, I can imagine something like that in 2020 in America too, is that, you know, on the one hand, you will see people having a totalitarian solution to the coming crisis. So that means border walls, you try and stop migration of people, you, you know, you try and control the what little is left of resources with wars. Um, you basically have this martial kind of attitude and clamp down on the streets. Activists on the streets will be chopped up if the right uh, wins out. And then you have that it's, it's all love and caring and we all you know, get solar panels and get, you know, do green new deals, and then we'll be fine. We can have our cake and eat it. Um, so it seems like that's where we headed is the, these two prongs. Um, and 
so I'm hoping that something like a dead strike is a proposal to cut through all of it, to say, you know, you can't really have your Green New Deals if you can't fund them. So China can't fund, fund its growth without debt. I mean, G needs debt to be one belt, one road. Um, and so if you undermine the debt markets, and I think you could because it's the derivatives market could collapse like it did in 2008. So if you did that kind of thing, you're cutting straight across and say, okay, none of you, we're taking away the punch bowl. None of you get, to have, you don't get to have your wars and you don't get to have your Green New Deal. Um, is, is that a correct viewpoint? Or do you think that uh, we should be keeping the economy going because we need to do things like geoengineering and they might cost? You know? I don't know. I'm not a fan of geoengineering. All the evidence indicates that no geoengineering strategy will come close to solving the problem. And, and the latest research indicates that from a, some, from a sociological perspective, it's just going to keep us addicted to the crack cocaine that, that are fossil fuels. So is that where we want to go? I think not. Look where that's taken us already. So, <clears throat> you, you know, I've been on an income strike for more than 10 years now. <laughs> not working out very well for me. Maybe a debt strike is the next obvious <laughs> strategy. So, <laughs> and, and I think you're right. The, the, you know, the, the magical thinking from the so-called left, to, to the extent there's any left left in, in the world, it does, it serves as no balance to the totalitarian uh, ideals of the far right. Where does that leave us? I, I, think the, I think there is no middle. There certainly is no radical middle. Maybe the death strike is the obvious way to go. I... I don't know enough about human behavior, although what I've seen hasn't been that impressive. And at scale, I don't know enough about sociology to be able to say this is the route we should go. I, you know, but it's clear that the route we're pursuing now is absolutely horrifying and has led us to the worst case outcome. You know, you, you pursue a scorched earth policy long enough, you end up with a scorched earth and we're this close. So it could be certainly what we're doing now is not working. Almost anything would be desirable. And I say almost because I can imagine some even worse scenarios. Hmm. What do you feel about the, the things like just slowing the economy down? I mean, it, to me, it seems beneficial just in terms of quality of life and in, in increasing our longevity for, because of just, if you just take the four horsemen, if you just, you know, like the pandemics and stuff, if you, you know, the commercial airline is God's gift to the pandemic. And uh, people talk about bugs coming out of the permafrost. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, there's anthrax outbreak up you know, in the, I think in the, um, the elk or something, I have a ranger up there. Um, so, uh, and then we've just got African swine flu and the, the Chinese have been killing off uh, pigs at a vast rate. I think it's going to run into millions. They might have to slaughter a quarter, I think, of the, the pork. And I think they, they live off pork pretty much. So that's going to impact the beef market. Food prices go up. I mean, should we just pull the rug out from under this and say, you know, this is... Um, Air travel has to slow down because people won't be able to afford to do it. We won't be able to afford to have wars. We won't be able to afford to do geoengineering. So, you know, that monkey wrench the financial system so that people are too poor to do all this crazy stuff. Right, right. And, and again, I don't know where the balance lies here. I know that terminating the industrial economy or even coming close to it is a terrible idea that will accelerate the extinction rate that we're imposing upon the entire planet right now as a result of the diminished aerosol masking effect. And, you know, I see these groups, Deep Green Resistance is probably the best known, uh, who the, the groups are clearly unwilling to keep up with evidence. When it became, I, you know, so I took these radical steps consistent with Deep Green Resistance and Idle No More and these organizations that promoted slowing or stopping the industrial economy. And then a few years later, when the full impacts of the aerosol masking effect came to be known, 
I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. And it was a damn good thing not everybody followed along behind me anywhere. We wouldn't be having this conversation today. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. So where's the line? I, I think keeping up with evidence is important. And the folks involved with deep human resistance clearly are not interested in evidence on any level. They're just interested in their brand. In, in saying these words that, are, that have been, become completely meaningless and in fact harmful. But where do we draw the line? I'm, I'm a huge fan of slowing down the omnicide, obviously. I'm a huge fan of slowing down the economy because it's absolutely not working for at least 95% of the people on the planet. Hmm. It's working for a handful of people. It's working great for you know the five or 10 or maybe five or 10,000 people in the world, but is it working for everybody? No, absolutely not. And I'd, if we could come up with a controlled descent of some kind, a controlled landing, that would be ideal. I don't see it out there. I talk to people almost every day, including engineers of all things, which is enough to take me over the edge, uh, you know, because engineers think we can solve anything through an engineering solution or set of solutions. And so I'm continuing to look for those alternatives to what clearly is a horrific set of living arrangements that is imposing its horrors, not just on the living planet, but upon actual people, entire communities, entire families of people. How do we get from here to there? I don't know. I'm open to almost anything. You know, I'll talk to engineers for crying out loud. That's how desperate I am. <laughs> I'm a recovering engineer myself. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. <Dennis. laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> so I don't know. I don't know that there is an, an answer, a solution. I know that that essentially everything that society is pursuing today is the wrong thing. Hmm. Growth for the sake of growth, as Edward Abbey pointed out, is the ideology of a cancer cell. And, and he also pointed out that civilization, like an airplane in flight, remains aloft only as it is moving forward. In other words, civilizations persist when they grow. They do not persist when they slow. They tend, in that situation, to collapse, Seneca Cliff style. Uh, but, but this isn't working. Let's try something else. And, and I'm inclined to think anything else would be better than this. But then I see the changes that have occurred throughout history. And clearly, anything else is not better than what was going on in the 1820s and the 1920s and so on. So this is a thorny predicament. We've, yes. we've painted ourselves into an enormous corner here. And I don't know the way out. I don't know that there is a way out, and I'm, I continue to seek opportunities for us as a species to squeeze through the bottleneck and for the other millions, billions, perhaps even a trillion species on Earth to squeeze through. You know, there's a paper in the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences from 2016 indicating there's a trillion species of microbes. So... There's a lot of species out there. Do we really want to take them all down with us? Is that the goal here? Yeah, I, I read the paper that you, you mentioned about co-extinctions and how uh, everything is basically through um, co-extinctions. The, the web is too tightly knit and coupled. And so, you know, people think of, you know, the, the wombat going extinct, but uh, the collateral damage of that uh, extends into fauna and flora and, and um, uh, it might be a burn down right to the to the bone because of that. It might uh, be a sterile planet. But assuming we, we're wrong and assuming that we want to maximize the chance that the first humans, a small band of humans squeak through and then, you know, higher mammals and then something down the skull and natura. You know, I, I mean, I don't want archaea and bacteria to be the only thing. That's right. Kind of, it's kind of, a, you know, it's, kind of, it's, it's a bit like, you know, fungus survives. Oh, great. That was, that was great. Um, but if we think in those terms of just making sure that things have enough habitat to squeak through, then shouldn't we just say that what we're trying to do is just scale back? 
and, and scale back regardless of the consequences, even the McPherson paradox. We just say, well, we'll just wing it and hope that somebody survives four degrees Celsius in the Arctic or some the high Arctic, something like that. Is, is that yes. the same thing to, to do? Yes, I absolutely agree. And if it were not for my ability to scale back personally, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation today. I'd be starving on the street because more than 10 years without a paycheck has its consequences. So obviously, almost any, almost any of us, certainly in the so-called Western world, the United States and Canada and Western Europe, almost any of us living in those places can scale back without a lot of detriment. You know, I already indicated that it hasn't negatively affected my waistline, my lack of a paycheck for these last 10 plus years. So are there things we can do to live closer to the earth to maybe become even more wholly part of the planet that we share with billions of species? Of course, obviously. Does that mean running to the mall to get the best set of hiking shoes before we go outdoors? Don't be ridiculous. You know, but, and that's the, the general approach that, I'm in, that I encounter when I suggest we take a hike. Oh, I need to get this and that and the other thing. There, there are dozens of ways that each one of us can scale back in our daily lives. Would it, would it matter? Well, I've been li living as if it matters, and we've got a scorched earth. So maybe it's just a matter of scale. Maybe it's just not cutting back far enough for enough people. I don't know, but I don't think that's a bad idea. I think living as if is an appropriate strategy, even if the as if hasn't worked out so far. You know, Rosa Parks sat on the quote, wrong seat on the bus. She was acting as if she had a right to sit there. And not too long after that, she had a right to sit there. Hmm. Well, so, yeah. so this acting as if we know has positive consequences. So let's do that anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the debt strike um, and Rosa Parks, uh, it, it is say we, we have a right not to be held accountable to debt for everything we do. I mean, we, we're born into a system of debt and we you know, live our lives essentially paying off the debt. And that's what the economy is, according to me. Um, basically, they, they give enough money into the system to, uh, to support it, but then they demand interest on top of it which keeps the thing growing and keeps it going. So a debt strike would be to say, you know, Rosa Parks style is saying like, I want to act as if I am a free person. Uh, you locked up the food, you locked up the land, you took away my ability to feed myself off this planet. Um, and I was born into that. So I demand that right back. Um, I'm not in debt to you for a living. Uh, so right. so I think that that's a little thing to say. I think that's very reasonable. I think that's a great idea. And I think that starting with people who are most indentured, which is the young people, is a great place to start. Let's get, you know, it's ridiculous. And I've been saying this for years that when, when you and I went to college, the expectation was that we would, as soon as we got out of college, we'd, maybe we'd mortgage ourselves to a house. And so we would start pursuing a career and we'd have this debt that ensured that we stayed on the treadmill for a significant period of time, 15 or 20 or 30 years, depending on the length of that mortgage. And I've been saying for years that college is the new house and you don't even get the house because college students today come out and they have a much bigger debt than, than we did by buying the house just for going to college. Mm -hmm. You just graduate college and you got a quarter million dollars in debt that you can never repay because the system doesn't work that way anymore because we're in the midst of an economic contraction, not economic growth as we experienced essentially our entire lives. This is patently unfair. And those, I'm going to call them kids, those young adults, those what, what I view as kids these days because I'm so damn old, they didn't have a chance. They were born into this system that that basically required them to pursue that college degree at great expense that they, many of them will never be able to pay off. I think that's horrible and I think it's terribly unfair. I think that's perhaps the first place we should start 
with a debt strike is just get rid of college debt. It's free in civilized countries, college. Yeah, I think that that is, so the proposal is to start off with uh, student debt, credit card debt, and medical bills. Part of the reason is it has a wide age demographic, but it turns out now that medical bills um, are, you know, the, the young are carrying an undue amount of burden on medical bills. It's not quite as you imagine that, you know, older folk uh, rack up the medical bills. Now it's uh, younger folk. But there are 48 million people that have student debt, and it's about 1.5 trillion now. And so, um, yeah, people like Elizabeth Warren um, are trying to cash in on it, trying to, you know, gain votes by saying they will tax the wealthy for 2% if you, over, you know, earn over about 50 million. Um, she's proposing a 2% tax and then free college and stuff like that. But it, it still remains your point is even if you be sensible and give free college to people, there's still a number of points is saying, are we being honest to kids saying, you know, this, this formula from the sixties that you go to college and that's a ticket to success. I mean, that, this is not the, this is not the GI bill. Uh, you know, this is a, a climate catastrophe world where there's probably huge disruptions. And I think that child, we should be honest with kids today and say, look, look, it's unconscionable to burden you with debt when we're sending you off into a system that is not going to keep you like your baby boomer parents. I mean, the, this world is not geared up. That we have the limit of the financial system, the production, the consumption, the, what the, you know, the habitat that, that supports us is everything's at its limit. So the chances of you cashing in this ticket uh, that we've told you is the key to success. We, it's a lie, and we ought to come clean on that. So we, we ought to be saying to them, if, you, if you're in college today doing something you don't want to because you think it's going to pay back later, I don't think a career counselor should be saying that. Um, no. be saying, you know, look, do something that is beneficial or something you enjoy, but assume the world's got, you know, 10 years, 20 years at max to run, um, before civilization collapses and then decide what you want to study in college. What do you think? Yeah, that's unconscionable. It's unconscionable to impose that upon young people, knowing what we know. The 1970 report, 1972 report at the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth, the projections from that report are right where we're at today. We are at the limits to growth. So e even if there were no such thing, as abrupt climate change, even if there's no such thing as a six mass extinction, we, we are at the, the limit of economic growth. We're there. We're not going to grow our way out of the six mass extinction. We're not going to grow our way out economically. We're not going to grow our way out of abrupt climate change. So continuing to tell young people, and we don't so much tell them as we assume, we allow them to assume and, and we don't counteract the idea that they're going to have this successful life forever like we've had. That's nonsense. There's all kinds of reasons we can point to indicating that the, the, the Pollyanna days of economic growth and the infinite growth paradigm, those are behind us. That's, that's done. You just, you cannot maintain infinite growth on a finite planet and only an economist would believe that you could yeah so it's growth of quality now it's it's uh, sort of quantitative growth you have qualitative growth as if you know you can have a better computer without consuming more resources it just gets better. and, and I'm, I'm not <laughs> and i'm not suggesting that as individuals you can't have a perfectly mm, pleasant life, no, no matter how long it is, there are ways to experience joy that don't involve buying a new phone every six months. And, and for me, at least, the primary joy that I've experienced in my life is by trying to bring joy to other people, trying to pursue a life of service. And that is what all, has always brought me joy. And that almost always comes at no cost. Yeah, the best things in life are free. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um I I I'm not sure how much time you still have to run, but this is very interesting. There's loads of things I'd still like to ask you. But um can I just ask a question about Viktor Frankl you mentioned in 
uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So it's been ages since I, I read that, but it's, he, it really came out of a concentration camp and his experience in a concentration camp and how people viewed, you know, in a, really it's, I guess it's kind of analogous to the situation we're in if we're facing abrupt uh, human extinction near term and that's you know people are looking forward to a gas chamber and then how do they how do they live and search for meaning inside a concentration camp which is about as extreme as you can get but we might be seeing that on mass um so ultimately what was his conclusion that what what is the people that found meaning in that what what, what was his take home from that? Hold on. Well, it, I think his take is encapsulated in those few words I read. And I want to now read the entire paragraph to provide some context to that final sentence. The final sentence is the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any set of, set of, set of circumstances. And as you pointed out, he was in various concentration camps in Germany during World War II. And yet even in those very dire circumstances where he thought several times he believed that I'm going to die today. Today is the day they are forcing me to get onto that train and all these people around me, and that's because they're going to take us to a place where they're going to kill us. So it was the most dire outcome we can possibly imagine. Multiple, th multiple times he thought he was being loaded into a car and that his death would come within a few hours. And the same was true for all the people around him as well. And yet he wrote this, between a stimulus and a response, there is a space. In that space is the power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. The last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances. So even when we're, we're down to the last few breadcrumbs, and it's you and me, and I conclude that I've gained plenty of weight in the last few months, and you haven't. So I'm going to hand you my breadcrumbs, because I think I'm going to be able to persist through another day. And not only that, but by giving you those breadcrumbs, I have made this choice in the most dire set of circumstances, when the odds seem truly impossible for either of us to survive, I have given to you what little I have. What better measure of our character then when we do that, when we sacrifice a little bit for somebody else, when we sacrifice maybe even a lot for somebody else, between a stimulus and a response, there is a space. The sp stimulus in his case was, we're going to load you people into a cattle car. We're not going to tell you what's happening. And you're going to assume that you're going to die. In my case, the stimulus is abrupt climate change leading to near-term human extinction. But there's a response. The response from Viktor Frankl was to seek meaning in service to others. Hmm. And that is my response as well. And that's the response I'm trying to encourage in others, is to seek meaning for your life in the service you provide to others. What better measure of our character than how we act in the face of impossible odds? And that's what Frankl was doing, and that's what I'm suggesting we do. Hmm. The odds seem truly daunting. I can't imagine we're going to make it through this one, folks. But he couldn't imagine he was going to make it through either. The difference is that was the level of the individual or maybe even the society, the community. And I'm talking about the entire species, the life on Earth, at least from a human perspective. But it's still not that big a difference. I think the analogy holds. I think that the, the notion that we still have the ability to respond that we still get to choose one's attitude regardless of the set of circumstances. I think that matters here. Yeah. I, I kind of think of it in terms of, well, if you, if you have a look at archeologists, say digging up a collapsed civilization, maybe the collapse of the Incas or the Aztecs, and you see that they went through hell, their crops failed, and then they start sacrificing children. And it's, it's brutal. It's just brutal. If you just read on one of those child sacrifices, what they like, they rip their hearts out while they're still alive and offer it all to try and stave off this collapse, which is self-induced. It's got nothing to do with cuts in the sky, but they, they, the, you know, the, the bloodletting and the, the punishment that they inflict on, on each other as they go down is all there in the archaeological record. And I kind of imagine 
Well, I, I think the chances of there being extraterrestrial life are getting lower and lower. I think new scientists just came out and said of those 4,000 exoplanets, uh, only one has water. So probably there isn't any extraterrestrial life. But assuming there is, assuming, you know, a thousand years from now, after we're all gone, they come and land on Earth. What story will they see in the archaeological record? And will, will they see these massive engineering projects where, you know, they, they see us, you know, emitting these greenhouse gases and we can't stop ourselves. So we have to collect them out of the atmosphere because, in there would, you know, you see the madness completely. You'd see all these rusting, um, these rusting uh, efforts on a monumental scale, which are just like you know, sacrificing children in the, in the modern sense. Um, and all these things that only made things worse. You did, you know, cloud seeding, you did solar radiation management, and they, they'd see this massive struggle written into our story. Uh, and that, that's how we're probably going to go down. And then they're going to be FEMA camps, and it's going to be managed right down to the last dreadful, gory detail. Uh, kind of Victor Frankl star. And I think, well, there's another path. Is it, imagine we left a record where we showed that we suddenly realized that we thought we were so damn smart and we had civilization and everything going for us. And then suddenly we realize we've, we've screwed it. We've screwed up in the most major way possible. And then they, we have in the record how we tried to scale back, how we were self-sacrificing, how we did everything we could to make sure that some of the, some species survived. All our actions were tuned towards that kind of nobility, that kind of self-sacrifice. And they'd say, wow, these people deserved to live. You know, it's so sad that they didn't because of their reaction. And it's like, right. that's the one we want. We want to have that, you know, if we go out on that uh, note, I call it a note of ataraxia. It's a great um, Greek word. Ask Pauline about it. <laughs> if she knows about uh, classical antiquity. Um, ataraxia is a, it's a, it's it's a hard word to describe because I think we lost contact with it, but it's uh, basically the, the attitude of mind of the doomed soldiers at Thermopylae. Um, you know, it's it's basically you know you're doomed. It's like the charge of the light brigade. You know there's no way out. Circumstances have got you in gridlock, and you you basically stuck. Um, you're gonna die. There's no way out, and you you go out with nobility and acceptance and very clean frame of mind. Um, they call it the, the ideal state so for soldiers to go into battle. And then I'm trying to promote that as the vision for that's what we should be doing. Not all this crazy old stuff. Right, right. I know, she, I know she knows about it because we wrote an essay about it together. And she brought in all these examples of people knowing, soldiers knowing they were doomed and yet they dug in their heels anyway. Knowing they were doomed and they danced off the cliff together an entire community of people dancing, knowing that they were going to be killed. Instead, they chose to take their own lives by dancing off a cliff. So she certainly knows, and those are a couple of examples of the kinds of things we can do in the face of these seemingly impossible odds. We can dig in our heels. We can fight with all we've got. We can act as if our actions matter, and then they might. We can accept as the people, as the community did who danced off the cliff, we can accept our demise and we would rather go out dancing than raping and pillaging at the hands of the soldiers from the other side. So we have a choice. The last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude in any set of circumstances. And I would extend Victor Frankl's sentence to say, the last of human freedoms is to choose one's attitude as well as one's actions in any set of circumstances. Well, yeah. So, Professor McPherson, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. It's been um, too short. I think there are too many things that I would say. Yeah, I would love to do it again if, you, if you're up for it. Yes, let's. So, well, thank you very much for this. I will um, put it up on YouTube with uh, great joy. And um, perhaps you'd want to put it up on your website too once I, I get it up. Of course, send me the link as soon as you can and I'll post it shortly thereafter. Okay, well, I would love to continue this conversation. So thank you so much and um, good luck up in New York. And uh, thank I hope you. the weather holds out there. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. 
Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.